This is Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Episode 21 Japanese Re Emergence. Simultaneously with the rise of Germany in Europe, we see the re emergence of Japan as an ambitious, although regional, international power in Pacific Asia. Japan is about the size of Britain, and like Britain, an island monarchy lying off the Eurasian landmass. But geography made Japan traditionally more secure than Britain. The Korea Straits are a hundred miles wide, a significant space. No one has been recorded as swimming across, and in recorded history, the only hostile fleets to cross over from the mainland were the Mongols, who failed in their mission to conquer the islands. Japan is close enough to the mainland to fall within the gravitational pull of China and Korea, which inevitably came from across the sea. These cultures exercised heavy influences upon the Japanese. For a century or so, in the late 1500s, while Europeans were searching the far reaches of the world ocean, the Japanese were important players in the international maritime culture of Pacific Asia, distinguished for private trade and piracy. Their reach extended to warfare, and the Japanese were able to invade the mainland, ferrying nearly a quarter of a million men across the Korea Straits, dwarfing the size of the Spanish attempt to invade England a decade earlier. But the Japanese failed to continue to command the sea, and the Koreans escaped conquest. And in the 17th century, a pendular swing turned the Japanese focus to domestic concerns, building a new, stable political order. This led to the government banning Iberian visitors who were aggressive proselytizers of Christianity and savagely repressing their converts. The outsiders were viewed as a front for conquest, even colonization. Thus, Japan endeavored to turn its back on the first oceanic revolution. A so-called closed country policy began in 1635 and would last for more than 200 years. Japanese were forbidden to build ocean-going ships or to travel abroad, with the resulting loss of shipbuilding and navigation skills. Although the Japanese could not venture into blue water space, a longshore activity continued to be important. Shellfish and finfish answered a need for protein on the table, and fish meal furnished fertilizer on the land. Coastal shipping traffic thrived with bulk commodities, notably rice, moving to hungry, heavily populated seaside cities. Osaka, Edo, today's Tokyo, among the world's largest at the time, sustained their density only by using the sea. Beginning in the early 19th century, as a phenomenon of the Second Oceanic Revolution, with increasing Atlantic penetration of global oceanic space, Japan's strategic situation changes dramatically. The nation experiences a new vulnerability to an encroaching Atlantic world. Ocean looms, as a major new source of continuing threat, Euro-American initiatives provoking Japanese response. Americans were initially interested in Japan in order to protect shipwrecked whalers roughly treated by the Japanese. And reflecting the new steam age, 
Americans saw Japan as a coaling bunker en route across the Pacific. China was the real target of American interest. Japan itself was regarded as incidental. But it lies on the Great Circle route, and in 1853-1854, Commodore Matthew Perry and his black ships, among them several impressively gunned, steam-powered, paddle-wheel warships, appeared on Japanese shores. The Japanese immediately perceived their vulnerability to these new weapons. Their loss of control over such contacts with outsiders rouses a sense of national crisis, abruptly thrust into a harsh Darwinian world the Japanese perceived themselves engaged in a struggle for national survival, a world in which ocean-born foreigners laid down the rules. In the name of the new Meiji Emperor, a new government takes over in 1868 with a realization of crisis and a resolve to meet it. Gradually, the leaders come to appreciate the need for sweeping change and become highly successful in affecting it. Why this success? Well, for one thing, the great oceanic powers were preoccupied elsewhere. Japan was not a target for colonization. A free flow of information enabled the Japanese to study the advanced world closely a well-educated and sophisticated society that emphasized education and a tradition of conscious cultural borrowing lubricated change. Under leadership that was young, vigorous, and seemingly omnicompetent, driven by acute awareness of the need for speedy change, they rapidly achieved a political consensus with values defined by the elite indoctrinating a national ethos by using the instruments of compulsory primary education and a conscript army. Putting the emphasis on adaptation to tradition, the leadership skillfully avoided the trauma of outright revolution, an actual revolution was presented as restoration. They understood the need for new knowledge to be gained from foreigners, but also the need for independence, self-reliance, the riskiness of over-dependence on foreigners, both in a material and abstract sense, their goods and their ideas. For self-defense, the Japanese needed a modern navy. Happily, they were unburdened by earlier technologies of wood and sail, and so they could move directly into the metal and steam of the Second Oceanic Revolution. The Imperial Japanese Navy nicely illustrates the stages of Japan's modernization. The judicious use of foreign advisors kept on tap, not put on top, were not allowed to make decisions. The education of officers, sometimes abroad, the future Admiral Togo, hero of the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, is a notable example. The Japanese bought their first warships abroad then ordered them abroad to Japanese specifications, with others of the same class built in Japan, perhaps 
with modest improvements. Gradually, they establish their own high competencies in a constant process of acquiring, mastering, improving, be it German optics, British torpedoes, or ultimately after World War I, British aircraft carriers. In the late 19th century, China's continued decline and the instability of Korea made for a Northeast Asia power vacuum, always a destabilizing phenomenon, and it seemed to invite Japanese intervention. Japan fought China successfully in 1894-95, but gained no permanent foothold on the continent. An alliance with Britain in 1902 became the centerpiece of Japanese diplomacy, but significant for both parties. It marks the end of Britain's splendid isolation. Because of the perceived German menace, Britain had to concentrate its fleet in home waters and wanted to keep only a minimal naval presence in China seas relying on the Imperial Japanese Navy to deter the Imperial Russian Navy. Just as Britain would leave the China Seas to the Japanese, so they would leave the Caribbean to the USA and the Mediterranean to the French. For the Japanese, the alliance meant that Japan would need to fight only Russia. If others joined, so would Britain. The alliance would ease Japanese access to the London money market. The sweat of the farmer financed the initial modernization, but war required immense capital, which Japan had to borrow abroad. From 1895 to 1904, the interval between the war with China and one with Russia sees the basic indices of Japanese economic strength. Iron, steel, coal production grow substantially. Foreign trade and the merchant marine virtually double. Naval tonnage swells four times. The Japanese buy and use advanced foreign technology and begin to build their own warships. They buy British-built heavy ships for their first real battle fleet, created around six quite similar units, all of the highest quality. Four of the six were the world's then strongest, the last of the pre-dreadnoughts, as good or even better than the British themselves then had. With these, Japan created a balanced, uniform fleet, six battleships, and six armored cruisers, making the Imperial Navy number four in the world. And this fleet could rely on efficient and nearby home shipyards for quick repair, although it had no modern ships in reserve. In global naval circles, a fog of uncertainty still lay over what the optimum fleet might be. That is, what would be the right mix of warship character and types? The race continued between guns and armor, the spear versus the shield, in effect. The Japanese continued to pay close attention to training, developing sophisticated teaching concerning strategic and tactical thinking, finding precedents in ancient Asian texts as well as from the Atlantic world. All this careful preparation would reap great rewards. On February 5th, 1904, the Japanese notify the Russians of their decision to terminate diplomatic relations. The next day, they capture two Russian vessels off the coast of Korea. On February 8th, they attack the great Russian naval base at Port Arthur. 
This is scarcely to be labeled a sneak attack, although the Russians denounce it as such. Although the Japanese surprise the overconfident Russians, their assault accomplished little, but they were able to seize the initiative and keep it on land as well as at sea and were able to move their armies safely to the Asian mainland, maintaining them there without serious opposition en route. This was a regional combat, fought only in Northeast Asia. Japanese power was geographically limited. They could not attack European Russia and its centers of power, nor could Russia attack Japan on its home islands. The Russians send an ill-prepared and largely inferior reinforcement fleet in an epic voyage from the Baltic to the Pacific, subsequently called the fleet that had to die. In the words of one critic, it was an archaeological collection of self-sinkers. The epic voyage itself, therefore, was a considerable achievement. The Japanese meet the exhausted Russians at the Tsushima Straits, May 27, 1905, in what Sir Julian Corbett, the first great British maritime strategist, would call the most decisive and complete naval victory in history. That Japanese victory was due to sturdier ships, the homogeneity of the squadron, better gunnery, more adroit maneuvering, and above all, higher speed. The war made local and global impact. To the Euro-American world, the war was viewed as a combat between David and Goliath, Punch showed Jap the giant killer struggling with the Russian Goliath. Japan is taken with new seriousness. The Atlantic world preened, pointing to the apparent success of Japanese modernization on the Atlantic model. A new oceanic Asian Britain. The Japanese victory wipes out some of the condescension and adds complexity to an earlier imagery of Madame Butterfly, Geisha Girl, Cherry Blossom, everything Japanese being seen as quaint, diminutive, even feminine. Now the Japanese are seen as defenders of the modern world, but at the same time, foreign admiration is tinged with apprehension. Thereafter, the Japanese Navy is wedded to the big ship, big gun, big battle mentality, and they look to war being decided in one titanic engagement, a replay of Tsushima, and they become frozen in that past. For Russia, 1905 was the opening gun of revolution, and strategically, defeat deflected Russia to Europe, at least until 1945. In the great Atlantic global oceanic empires, the defeat of the white man reverberated, prompting the stir of desires for independence. The Japanese public, because of press censorship, held an inflated idea of the nation's military power, and this would carry a long-term impact. As a Viennese journalist put it, victory is a poor advisor, and nations tend to slip on the blood they have shed. Germany, Japan, and the U.S. too, as we shall see, would deeply affect the maritime life and power of Britain.
Next, all of these three powers would deeply affect the maritime life and power of Britain and reshape the maritime world in new dimensions. So join us next time for episode 22, The USA, Rising Power. Revolution at Sea is written and spoken by John Curtis Perry, with additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg. Recording by 1623 Studios, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Production and distribution by Albert Buichardet-Ferret. Goodbye until next time. <laughs>